Hello and welcome to Basilicast, produced by the Basilica of St. Mary in Minneapolis. My name is Johan van Paris, and I am the Managing Director of Ministries here at the Basilica of St. Mary. As you may know, on the Solemnity of Corpus Christi in 2022, the Catholic Church in the United States launched a three-year-long Eucharistic revival to heighten our Catholic understanding of the celebration of the Eucharist and devotion to the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. The highlight, or one of the highlights, of these three years is undoubtedly the Eucharistic Congress that is being held in Indianapolis. This is the 10th Eucharistic Congress which is being held in the United States. The first one was held in Washington, D.C. in 1895, and the last one was held in 1941 in the Twin Cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. I mentioned that the first National Eucharistic Congress was held in Washington, D.C. in 1895. Was that the first ever Eucharistic Congress? It was the first Eucharistic Congress in the United States. But the first Eucharistic Congress ever held was in Lille, France in 1881, at a time when the church in France was in great decline. And the goal of this Congress was to promote devotion to the Holy Eucharist and to implant the love for the Eucharist in the hearts of people. This Eucharistic Congress is considered to be the first of a series of international Eucharistic Congresses. Hmm. And I happen to have an excerpt uh, written by the Bishop of Lille about this Eucharistic Congress. His name was Gaston de Ségur, and he wrote that Eucharistic Congresses are gatherings for the purpose of celebrating and glorifying the Holy Eucharist and of seeking the best means to spread the knowledge and love of the Eucharist throughout the world. The real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is one of the principal dogmas of the Catholic faith and is therefore of paramount importance as the most precious treasure that Christ has left to his church as a center of Catholic worship and as a source of Christian piety. So the first International Eucharistic Congress was held in Lille, France while the first National Eucharistic Congress in the U.S. was held in Washington, D.C. Has the U.S. hosted any international Eucharistic Congresses? Yes. Um, As a matter of fact, we've hosted two. First was held in Chicago in 1926. The second was held in Philadelphia in 1976. Uh, Pope John Paul II was among 44 cardinals and 417 bishops who attended that Congress, and Mother Teresa and Dorothy Day were among the speakers. Wow, it was very impressive. Now, when you look at the cities that the uh, national Congresses have been held, um, like St. Louis, New York, um, Chicago, uh, New Orleans, how did the Ninth Congress end up in the Twin Cities of St. Paul in Minneapolis. Well, um, Archbishop John Gregory Murray, who was the Archbishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis from 1931 to 1956, was asked by the Eucharistic Congress Committee of the United States bishops to host this Ninth National Eucharistic Congress. Um, This honor was seen as a testament to his zeal for the faith. He used to have a radio program on WCCO called Faith on the Air. Uh, The Basilica's pastor at the time, Father James Reardon, was appointed by the Archbishop as the general chairman of the Congress. Uh, Committees were established in both St. Paul and Minneapolis for this two-city event. Now we have the Cathedral in St. Paul, the Basilica in St. Mary. Were those the principal locations where this event took place? Actually, uh, because of the huge attendance for these events, the state fairgrounds were determined to be the most suitable. Um, It was called the National Eucharistic Center during this Congress, but there were events held also at the Basilica of St. Mary, at the Cathedral, and at the Minneapolis Auditorium. Oh, wonderful. Now, I imagine lots went into preparing for this Congress. What what are some of the highlights? Well, uh, first, a suitable theme was selected. That year, the theme for the Congress was, Our Eucharistic King Glorified by Sacrifice. An official emblem was created, and the 300,000 Catholics in the Twin Cities were asked to purchase a 50-cent silver medal 
to raise over one hundred thousand dollars, and That's you could beautiful. have one just for yourself. Oh my goodness! Um, thank you. Here at the Basilica, Father Reardon enlisted the school children of the Basilica School to sell them on the front steps as people came out of mass. Well, that's wonderful. Um, a special mass setting was commissioned from Pietro Jan, an Italian-born composer who made his career in the United States. This mass, entitled Misa Eucharistica, was sung by a choir of 1,000 adult voices, oh my goodness. accompanied <laughs> by the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra, which is now the Minnesota Orchestra. Impressive. During um, all the pontifical masses on Tuesday and Thursday of the Congress. Mm. In addition to this course, a combined course of 13,000 children sang. A third choir comprised of seminarians and priests of the archdiocese sang the plain chant propers. Wow. So what exactly happened during the Congress? Oh, so many things <laughs> happened during the Congress. Um, activities actually began two days before the actual Congress oh. commenced. On Sunday, June 22nd, um, that was considered a day of spiritual preparation for the Congress through celebration of the Eucharist in all the parishes of the Twin Cities and the state. Uh, on Monday, June 23rd, was the day of arrival, and tens of thousands of people arrived by train or car. Trains from the south and east of the United States were held in Chicago and then dispatched every 15 minutes oh. to Minneapolis. <laughs> oh. The papal legate, Dennis Cardinal Doherty of Chicago arrived about 4 o'clock in the afternoon in St. Paul, and over 5,000 people awaited him in front of the station. And all of that happened before the Congress actually began. So what happened, say, on the first day of the Congress? So the Congress opened with the 10 o'clock Mass at the National Eucharistic Center, which was the St. Paul Fairground. An estimated 50,000 people attended the Mass in the grandstand and surrounding seating. A nine-foot silver monstrance surmounted the raised altar. The official chalice of the Congress belonged originally to Bishop Joseph Creighton, who was the first bishop of St. Paul. Uh, sectional meetings began at 2 o'clock, followed by holy hours for men and youth groups. The midnight mass that day was attended by 80,000 people. Wow, amazing. So then the next day. And then the next day, uh, another, a 10 o'clock pontifical mass was celebrated for children, parents, and teachers, including 14,000 students oh. of middle and high school years. Afternoon sectional meetings followed by holy hours for clergy, religious sisters, and women. <laughs> and finally, the grand finale, the last day of the Congress, with many events. Many events. Eastern Rite Masses were celebrated at the Cathedral and at the Basilica on oh. the last day, with the Basilica hosting the Byzantine Rite in Old Slavonic wow. at 8.30 a.m. We might want to give that a try, oh. maybe, yeah. Basilica. At 10 a.m., a pontifical Mass for all pilgrims was celebrated under a blazing sun at the National Eucharistic Center. Um, over 300 people actually had to be taken off-site for heat exhaustion treatment. Oh. At the end of the Mass, the Holy Father, Pope Pius XII, gave a radio address from Vatican City and closed with a blessing of all the pilgrims. At 1 o'clock, a procession of the Blessed Sacrament was delayed by a brief but very heavy rain that broke the 91-degree heat and direct sun to a cooler and overcast sky. Mm. The procession began at 1.45 from St. Andrew's Church in St. Paul, went past an altar and a throne of exposition in Como Park. A monstrance from Reverend Felix Tissot, pastor of the Church of St. Anthony in 1865, was used. Marchers in the procession streamed by for over four hours. Wow. The procession ended at the Eucharistic Center under a fine drizzle of rain. The final benediction with 125,000 people present, closed the Congress during a complete downpour. Oh my goodness. Now, that was a grand ending, but it was not really the ending of all the festivities, was it? It was not, especially for us. On Friday, January 27th, 1941, the Basilica of St. Mary was solemnly consecrated, the first church in the city of Minneapolis to have that rite performed in it. The papal legate, Dennis Cardinal Doherty from Chicago was the main celebrant two additional archbishops and five bishops assisted. And the building was solemnly turned over in perpetuity for the use of divine liturgy. After the consecration ceremony, a pontifical mass was celebrated, followed by a celebration dinner 
for all the clergy at the Curtis Hotel. Oh. Amazing. <laughs> now, did you bring us anything from the archives as a show and tell? We have many items in the Basilica archives, thanks in part to Father Reardon being the general chairman of the event. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorites is this cross, which I'll hand to you, um, which is broken, which is why it is in the archives and not in the church. So I understand that these crosses mark the 12 locations where the consecrator anointed the walls of the basilica with sacred chrism during the consecration ritual. That's right. So this, these markings are, these crosses mark the very important spots throughout the basilica. And I think that the original one has been replaced with a new one uh, when this one broke. We have other fun things, this little pennant, which uh, attendees would have waved. Um, no, this is impressive. Yes. So this book holds all the addresses, um, all the catechetical sessions um, that were given during the Congress, correct? Correct. Um, this is, yes, this is the official record. Uh, we also have official records on LP of all of the masses, all of the speeches, all of the music, and also the papal address that came directly from Rome. Wow, maybe we should play that <laughs> <laughs> And then you have the Ninth National Eucharistic Congress. Um, this is with the more souvenir book. Ah, that's wonderful. So it has photos of all the attendees. The, the governor of Minnesota actually declared a state holiday in honor of the Ninth National Eucharistic Congress. Oh. Very impressive. In addition to all of these wonderful mementos, do we have any eyewitness reports? We do. Uh, George Busman, who was the Basilica organist and choir master, um, noted the following. He said, the idea of gathering together to pay special tribute in the form of adoration to the Blessed Sacrament is as old as the church itself. In times of stress and strain, in the event of armed conflict, it was a common thing for Christian Europe to expose the Blessed Sacrament for the veneration of the faithful. The fundamental purpose of a Eucharistic Congress is to render homage to the Blessed Sacrament. For that reason, more than 170,000 people gathered at the Eucharistic Center on the Minnesota State Fairgrounds for three entire days and nights. Our thoughts were directed specifically to the Eucharist itself whether in morning mass, the evening holy hours, or the discussion sessions that were held throughout the three days. Mr. Busman concluded by stating that many people were amazed at the simple devotion of pilgrims to this Congress and the inconvenience many of them suffered to be near their Eucharistic Lord. The immediate result of the Congress was that a deep devotion to the Blessed Sacrament was strengthened in the hearts of the people who attended. Thanks so much, Heather. This was wonderful. It is, of course, our hope and our prayer that this is the very result of the National Eucharistic Congress to be held in Indianapolis this month. Well, thank you for having me, Johan.